Guess who's back in the military spotlight? Japan's shaking off its peaceful image and stepping into some serious boots, aiming to become a major player in the defense game again. With neighbors casting nervous glances and an assertive China on the rise, Japan's move is stirring up the waters in East Asia. Today, we're diving into what's behind Japan's big pivot from pacifism, checking out their shiny new military toys, and seeing how old rivals are reacting to this plot twist. It's a story of transformation, tension, and alliances in the making. Join us as we uncover how Japan is rewriting its role on the regional stage, challenging the status quo, and maybe, just maybe, changing the game for good. But first, let's delve into the intriguing history of Japan's rise to power, setting the stage to peel back the layers of today's geopolitical shifts pushing Tokyo out of its strategic shell. What's driving this dramatic change, and why now? To understand, let's turn our attention to Japan's most formidable neighboring giant, China. The rise of China since it opened up following Mao's death, and particularly since it joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, has severely disrupted the international balance of power in East Asia. Between 2002 and 2022, China's economy grew by an average of 8.8% per year. In contrast, Japan grew only at an average rate of 0.65%, entering sharp recessions between 2008 and 2009, and again between 2019 and 2020. In 2010, China surpassed Japan as the largest economy in Asia and the second largest in the world. The new economic order inevitably meant a new military one. In 2002, Japan was ahead of China in military spending, with the former spending about $40 billion, the second most in the world, to China's $30 billion. That changed fast. China became the world's second largest military spender in 2007, a spot it's not relinquished since. In 2022, China spent almost $300 billion on its military, which was five and a half times Japan's expenditure at about $54 billion. The true number is likely higher than that, as the United States Department of Defense noted that China's real military budget is likely between 1.1 and 2 times higher than its official figures suggest. This would increase the gap between China and Japan to 11.2 times at maximum interpretation. China has used its new military might to build the world's largest navy by sheer number of vessels, modernize its air force, increase its nuclear stockpile, and build an arsenal of thousands of ballistic and cruise missiles. All of these assets severely threaten Japan's national security, and China has demonstrated a willingness to use them. In nearby seas and skies, China has cranked up its grey zone operations against the Senkaku Islands and Taiwan. In 2016, a Chinese naval vessel entered the 12 nautical mile territorial sea around the Senkaku Islands for the first time. Previously, only Chinese Coast Guard ships had done so. In 2018, a Chinese submarine did the same. In 2020, Chinese Coast Guard ships operated near the Senkaku Islands for 111 consecutive days, and 333 for all of 2020. In February 2021, Beijing enacted a new law authorizing the Chinese Coast Guard to use force against foreign vessels in maritime areas under Chinese jurisdiction. Conveniently, this includes the Senkakus, which China claims are its Diaoyu Islands. In 2022 and 23, China conducted a series of large naval and air exercises off Taiwan. As part of these operations, some missiles entered Japan's airspace and waters. Further afield, China's military expansion in the South China Sea threatens to cut the shipping lanes that Japan depends on. In 2022, Japan imported 25.3% of its GDP and exported 21.5%. 42% of this maritime trade passes through the South China Sea. Among the most important of these resources is oil going through the Strait of Malacca from the Persian Gulf. Though less pronounced than China's, the threat posed by North Korea's nuclear ballistic missile program, the latter of which frequently violates Japanese airspace, also poses a significant challenge for Tokyo. Japan also shares a maritime border with Russia, which became more aggressive against its neighbors under Vladimir Putin, ultimately leading to a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Tokyo and Moscow also dispute control over the southernmost Kuril Islands. Some policymakers in Japan have described their country as being on the front lines in the face of these aggressive authoritarian nations. In response to these developments, the Japanese government under Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced in November 2022 that it would increase defense spending to reach 2% of GDP by April 2027. While the reaction to this development was positive in the United States and among its Western allies, the response in the region was much more surprising. 
Some of the nations Japan has traditionally been at odds with, like South Korea, welcomed the move, if tepidly. Why is this development so surprising, and what implications could it have for Japan's influence in the region? To grasp the full impact, we need to delve into Japan's historically tense relationships with its neighbors. For most of its history, Japan was an isolationist country. Being an island nation, it could afford to be. Japanese warriors fought each other far more frequently than they fought foreign enemies. Prior to World War II, only one foreign power ever attempted to attack the Japanese home islands. This was the Mongol Empire under Kublai Khan in 1274 and 1281. Both of these attempts were short-lived failures, and Japan kept to its own devices for three more centuries. Still, Japan displayed an early willingness to learn from foreigners that would prove critical for its national trajectory later on. We'll get to that soon. When Portuguese traders brought firearms to Japan, the country's warriors quickly adapted to them. This was the country's Sengoku period, the span between the mid-15th and early 17th centuries that saw the decline of Japan's previous central government under the Ashikaga shogunate and the rise of ambitious and powerful feudal lords known as daimyo, who saw their chance to increase their wealth, power, and influence. In this era, Japan was one of the most militarized and dangerous places in the world, with more frequent and intense fighting than any other country. Hundreds of thousands of people likely died. Even so, Japan's militarism was contained strictly within its island borders. That changed radically in the 1590s. By then, the country had been brought to a period of relative peace thanks to the efforts of two of Japan's so-called three unifiers, Oda Nobunaga and Toyotomi Hideyoshi. However, Japan was still a heavily militarized society, and the peace at home was precarious, especially with Hideyoshi's lowly origins and lack of an heir of military age. In 1592, Japan abandoned its isolationism and invaded Korea. Hideyoshi apparently expected an easy campaign that would help consolidate his control over Japan, not least of which by removing many dangerous samurai that could rebel against him. On land, he was correct, as better armed and battle-hardened Japanese soldiers easily defeated their Korean foes. Although historians debate the grandness of Hideyoshi's ambitions, he made overtures of conquering Ming China, demanding tribute from the Spanish colonial government in the Philippines, and even moving onward to India. We will never know how serious he was about these ideas, but they did anticipate things to come, and it was the beginning of a long-running historical animosity between Korea and Japan. Hideyoshi's successor as the ruler of Japan was Tokugawa Ieyasu, who returned the country to its traditional isolationism. For 250 years, Japan remained at peace and cut itself off from the rest of the world. The only foreigners allowed to enter the country were Dutch traders at the port of Dejima near Nagasaki. It brought short-term benefits, but this policy nearly proved disastrous at a time when the power of the European empires was growing. In 1839, the first Opium War began in China. This marked the start of what the Chinese government considers today their country's century of humiliation. China was defeated, and subsequent defeats forced the Qing dynasty into unequal treaties with the Western powers. Japan proved much more adaptable. Although isolated, Japanese officials and scholars were interested in the Western knowledge the Dutch traders brought with them, and they remained informed of events abroad. When the American Commodore Matthew Perry arrived in Japan in 1853, the Japanese understood that they were at a hopeless disadvantage. Wanting to avoid the fate of China at all costs, forward-thinking leaders in Japan agreed to trade treaties with the West on far more equal terms than those imposed on China. They also ended the Tokugawa shogunate and built a modern industrial state under the authority of the Emperor Meiji in a period known as the Meiji Restoration. Japan successfully modernized and therefore avoided being colonized or dictated to by the Western powers. Indeed, the country's rise to international power in the late 19th century was phenomenal. To prove the point, it defeated the Qing dynasty in the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95 and annexed the island of Formosa, modern Taiwan, to its authority. It also forced Qing China to recognize the Korean peninsula as being in Japan's sphere of influence. After its victory over Russia in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, the Western powers tacitly acknowledged Japan as the hegemon of Northeast Asia and did not interfere in the sphere of influence it had created for itself. Japan had once again ended its isolationism and achieved a level of power only supposedly imagined in Hideyoshi's wildest dreams. With this success behind it, Japan was in a position to launch its bid for domination of the wider Indo-Pacific region. Under the umbrella of the Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, Japan hoped to solidify its hegemony over all of East Asia, pushing out both Western imperialism and communism. However, Japan's defeat in World War II ended these ambitions. 
The country's post-war constitution explicitly renounced war, or even the threat of war, as a legitimate function of the new Japanese state. Constitutionally, Japan may only maintain a military force adequate to its self-defense. For the rest of its geopolitical security, it would rely on its new ally, the United States, whose military was stationed in the country partially as a way of preventing Japan's strategic resurgence. For decades, this arrangement kept East Asia in a state of relative peace. But even so, Japan's neighbors never forgot the country's aggressive foreign policy, both under its previous Meiji regime between 1889 and 1947, and in some cases, the much more remote Sengoku period. Japan still remained a significant regional player, it was, until 2010, the largest economy in Asia and had a huge soft power presence through the power of its popular entertainment industry. Despite this, anti-Japanese sentiment remained strong, which was one of the reasons why Tokyo resisted rearmament for such a long time. Even with the hawkish policies of Shinzo Abe, who was in power for a record nine years between two terms, Japan proved institutionally reluctant to a major shift in its post-World War II defense posture. Although Abe increased military spending, he did not do so in a way that radically departed from his predecessors. Abe had more success in loosening the strict interpretation of Japan's Article 9. In 2015, the PM pushed legislation through the country's parliament that recognized Japan's right to be involved in collective self-defense with its allies, meaning that it could deploy its military overseas to assist its allies in the event of hostilities. Although this move was welcomed by the United States, it set off deep doubts among other countries in Asia, especially in the Northeast. Nevertheless, it's arguable that Abe was making a smart bet with his plans to expand Japan's military power. The shift in the region's geopolitical balance and the way Japan remade itself in the decades after World War II also meant a gradual shift in public sentiment toward the prospect of a more capable Japanese military in the region. For example, in the late 1970s, Japan began its Fukuda doctrine of reaching out to the Southeast Asian nations by reiterating its pacifism and emphasizing a more equal relationship. This helped to improve relations with those countries until Japan was viewed positively. In 2015, both China and Japan were viewed favorably by a majority of the public in the region, according to a Pew Scientific survey of over 15,300 people. Over 80% of the public in Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines viewed Japan favorably, while 71% of Indonesians did. Such views of Japan in the areas it formerly occupied reflects the effectiveness of the Fukuda Doctrine and Tokyo's soft power strategy. Still, further north, in the area with the deepest historical experience with Japan, views were far different. Only 25% of South Koreans and 12% of Chinese viewed Japan favorably. That same year, another Pew study revealed that 61% of South Koreans viewed China favorably, 78% of Malaysians, 63% of Indonesians, and even 54% of Filipinos did. But the Vietnamese had a sharply negative 74% disapproval rating of China, and 89% of the Japanese public did. By 2023, when the results of China's more aggressive foreign policy had become more apparent, the situation changed sharply. In that year's Pew survey, 77% of South Koreans viewed China unfavorably. Approval in Indonesia also dropped dramatically, with a 49% favorable and 25% unfavorable rating. Japan, meanwhile, largely maintained its favorable ratings. A 2023 poll of ASEAN countries by the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs revealed that 93% of those surveys had a favorable view of Japan. 91% valued the country's role as an upholder of peace and stability in the region, and 88% said Japan was a peace-loving nation in the decades since the end of World War II. Doubts remained. Taiwan and South Korea, the two countries with the deepest historical experience of being occupied by Japan, were the most hostile. Even in 2020, President Tsai Ing-wen saw criticism for tweeting in Japanese during her re-election campaign. However, for a Taiwan constantly under threat from a mainland Chinese regime that has repeatedly said that reunification is not optional, there has been little choice but to embrace Japan. A 2022 survey by the Japan-Taiwan Exchange Association's Taipei office, essentially the Japanese embassy in Taiwan, revealed that 60% of respondents said Japan was the country they could trust the most, which was up by 10 points from the previous study done in 2018. 60% also chose Japan as their favorite foreign country. The shift in attitude is more pronounced among younger cohorts. Of Japan's neighbors, relations with South Korea are the most complicated. They grew worse even as China's intentions to unilaterally overthrow the status quo in the region became clear. 
In 2019, Japan announced it would no longer consider South Korea a favored trading partner and imposed export controls on electronic components that are vital for major South Korean companies like Samsung. The move came after diplomatic and court battles involving Japan's atrocities in Korea during the colonization period between 1910 and 1945. South Koreans responded to Japan's move with a widespread boycott. However, relations between the two began to mend with the election of Yoon Suk-yeol to the South Korean presidency in 2022. In the summer of 2023, Yoon and Kishida met with Biden at Camp David. There, they released a statement committing to a new era of cooperation, including annual meetings at the summit and ministerial levels on security and economic matters. The shift marked an end to South Korea's previous policy of trying to deepen economic ties with China while maintaining its security alignment with the United States. With such winds behind it, Tokyo could begin its new military buildup on firmer footing in the region. When the Kishida government announced its intentions for Japan's military, reaction in the region was not as hostile as it would have been a few years earlier. For example, in Thailand, a country not occupied during the war but forced into alliance with it, state media reacted in a mixed manner. It warned Japan to be extremely careful, as if this trend continues unabated, it could backfire and rekindle old flames. Nevertheless, the ties praised Japan for strengthening its maritime security operation with Vietnam, the Philippines, and Indonesia. In South Korea, public reaction was more negative, with some media sources fearing that Japan's new offensive capabilities would lead to unwelcome military involvement on the Korean peninsula. Nevertheless, South Korea's foreign ministry was much more receptive to the announcement than it would have been a year earlier. While warning that Tokyo must get its consent before taking any action that would gravely affect Seoul's national interests, such as using its new counter-strike capability around the Korean peninsula, the South Koreans nevertheless said that it was desirable for Japan to implement a security policy that would contribute to regional stability. In August 2023, the United States, South Korea and Japan showcased their united front with joint ballistic missile defense drills in the East China Sea, a direct response to North Korea's botched satellite launch. Fast forward two months, and the trio unveiled their inaugural trilateral aerial drill. But Japan's strategic alliances stretch beyond this triad, its fortifying relationships across the region. As a pivotal player in the Quad alongside the United States, Australia and India, Japan actively engages in exercises like Malabar, reinforcing its military footprint. A testament to this expanding reach is the deployment of Japanese F-35 jets to Australia, marking a new chapter of defense cooperation. Japan's web of security partnerships isn't just growing, it's evolving, knitting a stronger fabric of regional defense with Southeast Asia as its latest thread. But how is it doing this and what does this mean for the future of Asia-Pacific security? In 2016, despite the overtures then-President Rodrigo Duterte made to China, Japan and the Philippines, signed an agreement allowing the transfer of defense equipment. In 2023, this bore fruit with the Philippines purchasing a Mitsubishi electronic warning and radar control system. In April 2022, Japan and the Philippines agreed to expand their partnership and conduct more joint military drills. In November 2023, Japan and Vietnam agreed to deepen their bilateral security cooperation, including the potential for the former to transfer military equipment to the latter. The next month, Japan and Malaysia announced they would elevate their relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership. This announcement included the signing of a new security deal worth $2.8 million to help Malaysia's maritime security. Equipment provisions included supplies and rescue boats, and according to Malaysian sources, monitoring and surveillance equipment. Many of these new partnerships are part of Japan's Overseas Security Assistance Program, which is part of its new regional security strategy. This is an understated break from its post-World War II foreign policy, which forbade Tokyo from using international aid for military purposes. Other partner countries in the OSA include Fiji and Bangladesh. While this program forbids the transfer of lethal equipment, there's no guarantee that prohibition will remain in place in the future, should policymakers in Tokyo consider the transfer of lethal aid to be warranted. Perhaps the best way to sum up the situation comes from the same Thai state media source we mentioned earlier. It must be clear today that the Japan with which Southeast Asia has been familiar throughout the post-war years is no longer the same. The past 70 years of a docile Japan are no more. The news that Japan would be ending its strategic retreat would in prior years be met with great alarm in East Asia. However, the times are changing fast. 
Because of the success of its economic partnerships and the flowering of its soft power, Japan was able to improve or mend relations with nations it once abused, and the rise of a newly aggressive China has left these less powerful nations with little choice but to align with Japan. While the new weapons it's arming itself with might get the most attention, the broader military context is that Japan is gradually ending its hard power isolation. With its new military hardware at home and security partnerships abroad, including with partners that might have been unthinkable a few years ago, Japan is poised to be a regional military powerhouse, and this time with a much more positive reception among its neighbors. What do you think about Japan's military buildup and the security partnerships it's made with its neighbors? Is Japan about to reclaim its place as the leading military power in East Asia? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Now go and check out how the Ukrainian conflict is reshaping Japan's defense strategy, or click this other video instead. Also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts.